Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Drew. And if you're here, then be prepared to talk about IPsec for a long time, because uh, we're going to get in the weeds here. Um, so thanks for being here. I hope everyone's enjoying their day today so far. Um, but let's jump into it. Um, well, actually, OK, before we jump into it, I do want to give a huge shout out to all these people on this slide here. Um, I'm really excited to be here, because this has been a passion project for about two years now. Um, and at some point, whether they remember it or not, each one of these people has provided some sort of advice or mentorship um, along the lines of this project. So wouldn't be able to do without them, so huge shout out to them. Um, and also thank you to my amazing wife, uh, who has listened to me talk about IPsec nonstop. Um, and it's not great dinner talk, so thank you. <laughs> um, OK, so just a quick icebreaker, uh, a little bit about me. I've been an ice surveillance doing performance and scalability for about two and a half years now. Um, I'm out in Boulder, Colorado, so pretty close to here, and I love to rock climb and, and cook in my free time. Um, and these are my cats. This is Kenzie and Dove. Um, at one point during an offsite, I actually gave a presentation about them, uh, which was a ton of fun. If you ever get the opportunity, I would highly recommend it. Um, we even got some other folks to show their pets off, too. It was a good time. Um, all right, so what are we doing here today? So we're going to talk about one of IPsec's major bottlenecks um, and then go into a potential approach for how we can fix it. Um, this is mainly like a starting point for the approach, just laying the groundwork. Um, we'll talk about some benchmarks to kind of go into how it performs, some takeaways for the future, and then kind of the next steps uh, after today. So let's get into the bottleneck. Um, this bottleneck centers around received side scaling. So let's talk about some background context before we get into IPsec specifically. Receive site scaling, or RSS as it's commonly referred to, is responsible for steering packets to CPUs um, on the receiving end. Um, so its job is anytime you get a client pod that sends out traffic from a node, um, receive side steering in the NIC is what paralyzes um, the processing of those packets on your server node. Um, so if, this is the example I'm going to use throughout the presentation. Just um, couple of client pods on node A connecting to an Nginx pod on node B. Um, and so the, the method that RSS uses to do this um, is, has a couple of steps. So first, what it's going to do is it's going to look at the packet metadata that it's receiving. This is anything in the IP header, even the MAC address, UDP header, TCP header, um, anything that Nick supports and different vendors support different things. It's going to take that metadata and hash it. Um, don't you remember this? The common hash that is used is the toplets hash. So if you're curious, that's a good keyword to Google. Um, and then as soon as that hash is determined, uh, it's going to be looked up in an indirection table. And this maps hash values to different queues in the NIC. Um, and so then we get our receive queue index. And then the CPU for that queue pulls it, pulls the packet in, and then sends it up to user space to the pod. Um, so this is really complicated just to steer packets. Why couldn't we just round robin packets? Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, the way that I like to think about it, though, is with this example. Um, so let's say that we have our client pod that sends out four packets in quick succession, and we round robin. So they alternate between CPU 1 and CPU 2. Um, and let's say also in this example that CPU 2 has some stuff scheduled on it. So it's a little bit slower to do some packet processing. Um, in this case, packets two and four are going to be finished and ready to go to user space um, after packets one and three. So packets will be ready for user space out of order, um, which means that the kernel has to do extra work to make sure that the packets are delivered to user space in order um, by doing reordering. So the kernel will actually hold on to packet number four until two and three come in and then send four on its way. And this is just bad for any sort of session type protocol performance. Um, so Nix prefer to use RSS instead of round robin, just because TCP is so popular. Um, but for UDP workloads, it is important. But that's why um, we use hashing for RSS. Um, so now let's pivot, and let's go into IPsec stuff, and we'll kind of connect the two. Um, so first in background, Selenium has an encryption mode where you can enable transparent encryption through IPsec. Um, Selenium will set up IPsec tunnels between nodes, and then any pod traffic that leaves a node will go through the tunnel to the node that it needs to go to. And then Selenium will take that packet on the receiving end, unencrypt it, and send it off to your pod. Um, and it does all this you know, for you, which is really nice. Um, 
But the key here is that, actually, let me go back. The key here is that these tunnels are established node to node, and they're not established pod to pod. Um, and so what happens is that any pod traffic, you know, here in yellow up here, um, is going to get encrypted and then put inside of an ESP packet, which is an underlying protocol that IPsec uses. Um, and all of that metadata is going to become invisible. It's going to be encrypted. So RSS can't use it. So the only metadata that we get is the protocol and the source and IP, anything in the IP header. Um, and since these tunnels are established node to node, we're always going to get the same hash for RSS, regardless of what uh, traffic is flowing through the tunnel. So all of your IPsec traffic, all of that traffic on the tunnel is going to go right to one CPU, um, because it can't differentiate between flows traveling inside the tunnel. Um, and so this can cause huge performance degradations up to you know, an order of magnitude of uh, like 5x, um, which isn't great. Um, so what can we do about it? So I was pretty new to eBPF when I learned about this. So I just Googled eBPF RSS tutorial, um, which worked out great. It landed me on this kernel documentation page for what's called the XDP CPU map. And this map was built specifically for software-based RSS which is also known as Receive Packet Steering. Um, it is RSS that's performed uh, well, by software, um, so inside of an XDP program. And we can use this helper called BPF Redirect Map um, to essentially steer a packet to any CPU that we want when it's received. Um, so I was like, OK, this is great. Let's just do that. Um, why not? But there were three problems that we had to solve uh, before we could move ahead and move forward with this. Um, we needed to figure out how we could actually differentiate between flows within a tunnel, like what that metadata that we want to use is. Um, we need to figure out how to transfer that metadata from the sender to the receiver, so that way the receiver can use it to do RSS. And then um, when we have that metadata on the receiver, we need to figure out how we can actually do that steering and what that's going to look like. So let's start with problem one. Um, so this is just like a helpful graphic that um, to visualize it, we're trying to solve for this context here, down here. Because um, the inner packet is from the pod is going to go to the XFRM stack in the kernel to be encrypted and turned into an ESP packet. And then we need some context that we can combine in that packet to make an enriched ESP packet we can send off. Um, so kind of digging down, this is a flame graph um, that was taken on a node with a client that was sending traffic to another node in a cluster with Selenium IPsec encryption enabled. Um, and this is really hard to read, so let's kind of highlight the important bits. Um, there are two functions that are important here, IP output and XFRM output. Um, the, the Linux uh, networking stack is super complex, so these functions do a lot of different things. The high-level idea is that IP output is called whenever we finish creating an IP header for a packet, and we're sending it up the stack on its way to do whatever needs to happen next. Um, and in this context, XFRM output is called whenever we're doing the same thing, but for an ESP packet. Um, actually, excuse me, let me back up. Not the same thing for an ESP packet. XFRM output is used when we are ready to create an ESP packet. Um, so we'll get the IP packet from IP output, We'll send it to XFRM output, which will create our ESP packet. And then we'll send it back to IP output to add the IP header in front of the ESP packet so we can send it out. Um, and so using a little bit of BPF trace, we can actually inspect the packet at these different intervals um, in, the, in the kernel. So this BPF trace script essentially says, OK, before you execute IP output and XFRM output, show me some packet metadata, like the source and the destination IP, the protocol of the packet. Um, and show me whatever hash you currently have for that packet that's stored in the SKB. Um, and just for context, the SKB is the kernel's internal representation of a packet and is passed along different functions as that is constructed. Um, and the hash attribute is calculated for various different um, subsystems in there. Um, so taking a look, uh, this is some output that we get on a transmit side. Um, this is read top to bottom. Um, so zooming in to make this a little easier. Um, we see something really cool. So we see a call to IP output with a UDP packet. Um, so we're saying, OK, we have a UDP packet that's being sent out, and we need the IP header. Um, let's keep going. And then we see a call to XFRM output with that UDP packet. So the kernel is going to take that packet, put an ESP header on it, and then send it on its way. And then we see that last call to IP output, where we add the IP header onto the ESP packet. And the key thing here is that the hashes that it's stored in the SKB is the same for all of these. 
So even though on the last call to IP output, we're dealing with an entirely different packet, it's an ESP packet with the node source and destination IP addresses, we still have that inner packet hash that we can reference. Um, so this is great, we can use that as our context piece. So let's take that hash and put it into the ESP packet and send it on its way so we can do RSS. Um, so now we come to problem two about where we put it. Um, conveniently, inside the ESP header, there's a field called the security parameters index. And this is a critical field for ESP that essentially um, identifies an IPsec tunnel um, and associates a packet with a tunnel. But RFC 4301 describes it as arbitrary. Um, and 32 bits is huge. The highest SPI I've seen for Celium is 10, and we can support 4 billion with a 32-bit number. Um, so why don't we just borrow some bits there? So we'll reserve one byte for the SPI, and then we'll use three bytes for the hash, and we'll just kind of combine it together, um, and we can use masking to accomplish this. Uh, and there we go. So on the sending side, with the Celium data path kind of visualized here, our client pod will enter into the Celium data path, which will forward the packet to the XFRM stack in the kernel. We'll hit bpfhost.c in the Celium data path where we can add that hash in, because at this point we have our ESP packet and we have the inner packet hash, and then we'll send it on its way out to the server. And this is what that looks like in eBPF. Um, it's just a you know, couple of 10 lines of code. Um, you see the bottom here is where we construct the SPI. Um, so now into problem three. What do we do on the receiving end? Um, so the existing data path for Celium essentially looks like this, right, where we take in the NIC, and the NIC is going to steer into a CPU on the node, which is going to hit uh, Celium's data path, go to the XFRM stack for decryption, and then it'll make its way to the pod. Um, but let's add XDP in the mix, right, because we're utilizing the XDP helper, and Celium already has a BPF XDP program that we can just enable and load for us. Um, and so we'll do this. So we'll have the NIC perform RSS, get us into a CPU on the node initially, and then we'll trigger our XDP program. And then inside there, we'll remove the hash from the SBI, restoring it to its correct value. We'll pick a CPU and perform the redirect using it, and then we'll send it on to the um, Celium data path, the rest of it. You know, we'll hit BPF network, we'll go into the stack, you know, et cetera. Um, and this is what that looks like. This is the function that does that. Um, again, just a couple of 10 lines of code. Um, this is probably hard to read uh, from the audience, but there's a, a, the third block from the top is where we actually perform the critical part of resetting the SBI and picking the CPU. Um, and there, there's a link to this PR at the end as well, um, in case you're interested. So with it done, let's benchmark it and see what happens. So I set up a, a three-node Equinix metal cluster. Uh, we had one control plane node and two worker nodes. The nodes had eight cores and a 25 gigabit per second NIC. Um, and then I did some net perf pod to pod tests. So a stream test, a request response test, and a connect request response test. Um, and just if you don't know, uh, a stream test tries to send as much data through a connection as possible. A request response test tries to do a back and forth um, request and then response. And a connect re request response is the same thing, but we set up a new connection between the client and server every time. Um, and then I, I executed this with uh, 1 through 16 clients to see how it would scale. And here's what we get. Um, so for the stream test, we can see that our baseline up top is CMM configured without any encryption. Down on the bottom, we have IPsec and WireGuard configured by Celium. And then that line up the middle is with receipt side scaling, the one that we just implemented. So as the number of, of clients increases, our throughput increases as well, um, because we're able to utilize more CPUs to process uh, more flows. Um, and this is where the 400% comes from the talk title. At 16 cores, we're getting a throughput increase, increase of 430%, um, which isn't bad compared to IPsec. Um, I'm extremely happy with that. Uh, with WireGuard, it's a little bit less. It's like 289%. Um, but that's just because WireGuard is more efficient at processing packets anyway, so its baseline throughput is a bit higher. Um, but we still get a scaling effect. This is the request response test, which is measuring latency. Um, and the cool part about this is that um, again, IPsec with RSS is performing better than IPsec without it and better than WireGuard, which is really exciting. Um, I don't know what's going on at 16 clients with IPsec here. Um, that's something that I want to investigate. It's kind of interesting. It just kind of drops down. Um, but 
the big takeaway from here is that uh, the RSS IPsec is performing really well. Um, for connect request response, we see a little bit of a different story. So this is the kind of benchmark that is going to be the hardest on this implementation because the steering doesn't do anything, right? We're steering, we open a connection, we steer the packet to a processor, we you know, send the response back, close the connection, and we do the same thing. So the steering is essentially just adding overhead to the whole, to the whole thing. Um, but the cool part is, is that it doesn't perform too much worse than IPsec in general. There's this little spike with two clients that I want to look at. Um, but overall, it's not as bad. So it's not like a huge latency increase after enabling it. Um, and I use Node Exporter to, connect, uh, to collect some metrics uh, during this test. And we can actually see this, this scaling effect in action. So here's the CPU usage for WireGuard and IPsec. Each one of those little bumps in the graph is a test. Um, we started with two clients on the left, and then we had 16 on the right. With IPsec, we see that CPU usage increase over time. So we're trading off increased throughput for increased CPU usage. Um, and it's really exciting that we can see more CPUs getting involved as we increase the number of clients. And using SoftNet, we can even show what processors, what processors um, are processing which packets. So with WireGuard and IPsec, we see one CPU that's involved. But with uh, receive side scaling, we get kind of a pretty rainbow here. Um, so we can see that more processes are getting involved. If we zoom in, though, and this is something I really want to point out. Um, on the left here is a test with two clients, and on the right is a test with four. On the left, the CPU usage per core is pretty even, but on the right, there's one that has extra utilization. And this is because the steering, the way that we're doing it is we're taking the hash and then we're modulusing it by the number of CPUs on the node. And that works, but it's not perfect. So some cores may get extra clients um, and as a result get extra uh, usage. Um, so that's something that I want to look into in the future as an improvement. So a couple of takeaways from this experience. Um, pros of this implementation is that it's really fast, uh, it's really simple, and it works on any kernel that has the XTP redirect handler, so anything greater than 4.15. Um, and the cool thing is that it can be done outside of Selenium if you want, uh, which I'll show here in a second. Um, drawbacks to this approach, so your NIC driver has to support XTP in native mode, because otherwise you're not going to get that performance improvement. You're just going to get extra overhead. So this means that if you're running in GKE, this can't be used, um, as an example. Um, and there's no guarantee on an even distribution uh, to CPUs, so the benefits of this may be workload dependent. Um, and then a couple of security concerns. So we're taking the inner packet hash in our ESP packet and we're putting it into the ESP packet itself. So ESP packets are no longer transparent to what flow they're carrying. And as a result, this could create a risk of a side channel attack, um, which is something that, that may, or not, may, or not, may or may not be an acceptable risk. Um, additionally, there's a field in the ESP packet called the integrity check value, or the ICV. This is calculated using the SBI, and since we're changing the SBI after the ICV is calculated, it becomes incorrect on the wire. Um, so if you're monitoring ICV correctness, then uh, you'll see some, some mistakes, um, but it's normal. And then additionally, um, this implementation still only uses one RxQ on the NIC, because the NIC is performing RSS to get us into XDP, and then XDP performs RPS to get us onto the, onto the core that actually does the ESP packet decryption. Um, and so there are alternatives implementation that, uh, that can be done in order to utilize all of the queues on a NIC. They were just more complicated, so we started with the easy one. Um, so if you want to do this outside of Selenium, it's the same architecture, right? You have one program run on egress that adds the hash into the SPI, and then a program on ingress that removes it. Um, Here's the entire egress program. It fits on a slide. Um, the red part is the, the fun part. The rest of it is just boilerplate to make the eBPF verifier happy. Um, for the ingress side with XDP, same thing. It fits on a slide. It is two columns, but I'm counting it. Um, in red, it, again, is the fun part. All the rest is just boilerplate. Um, and this is the implementation that I used to test this out as a proof of concept. And I was seeing similar um, throughput improvements as well, if not better. So moving forward, um, I'd like to get this merged into Celium. Uh, there's currently a PR up with the full implementation, including all the user space side stuff, if you're curious. Um, 
There are additional some other maturity related things that I like to do. So for instance, this only supports native mode routing. It does not support tunnel mode, um, which is kind of a bummer. So that'd be a cool thing to follow up on. I could do some metrics for observability purposes, like number of packets processed per core, uh, rather than having to rely on node exporter. Um, and then addressing the cons that we talked about earlier, right? So for security, is putting the hash in the SBI acceptable or not? And if it's not, then how can we address that? For performance, maybe we could encapsulate the ESP packet in a UDP packet and then use the source port as our differentiator for flows. Um, and that way we could do RSS on the NIC and we may not even need the XTP program. Um, but there are some trade-offs, so it's, it's something that we'd have to test. Um, and additionally, some like smartness, making it smarter. So if we could steer packets based off of CPU usage rather than just randomly, that would be really cool because then we can be more efficient with how we utilize CPUs. But that's all I have for you. Thank you very much.